and welcome to Fresh Take. Today, Savinj and I have invited former Ambassador Richard Kozlerich, distinguished visiting professor at George Mason University, diplomat and writer and interim director of peace operations at George Mason. He's also U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan from 1994 to 1997. It's an honor to have you on Fresh Take, Mr. Ambassador. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having having me. Good to, good to talk to both of you. We have many questions for you. Okay. Ambassador, I would like to start, if, if we may, uh, from events uh, in Azerbaijan, recent events when opposition uh, leaders were arrested uh, following the uh, peaceful march to visit the Alley of Martyrs. What's your take on that? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm given up trying to understand why, um, why the current uh, current regime does what it does. Uh, it seemed to me that um, on just just on the face of it, it was an unnecessary provocation, and it came on the heels of John Bolton's visit to uh, to Baku, where, according to the media, he said he raised human rights issues with with the government of Azerbaijan. So. Uh, I'm not sure why they they felt a need to to do this um, uh, at the time that that they did. Uh, I've been seeing signs that they've uh, you know they've been they've been warning people that uh, they were not going to tolerate uh, uh, public demonstrations, and they have uh, criticized Ali Karimli in particular um, in a way that. Uh, Left me not surprised that he he was detained, uh, but it just you know it's an unnecessary uh, disruption uh, when Azerbaijan is trying to be seen as a reliable partner not only with the U.S. but other countries as well, and as a you know a country that that wants to be regarded for for its uh, um, uh, culture, rich culture, and it, its history, and it's uh, moving on it on a path that would uh, would make it a, a you know an attractive place for tourism and and closer relations uh, you know with a lot of countries including the US uh, it's you know i'm i'm disappointed not surprised disappointed and uh, you know another unnecessary uh, step against uh, the observance of human rights so also, we were wondering what your take is on the Norwegian embassy moving from Azerbaijan to Georgia. Is this a viable strategy to nudge Azerbaijan toward democracy or? Well, I, you know, it's hard to tell uh, from what I've read what the motivations were. I, I know for small countries like Norway, um, they, uh, as, as uh, the British like to say, punch above their weight diplomatically. Uh, they have, uh, you know, a strong diplomatic core and a presence in countries that, like Azerbaijan, that uh, perhaps if, if you were trying to be uh, hard-headed about budget expenditures, this might be an, uh, an, a post to close and, and uh, you know, consolidate. When I was ambassador, uh, if I'm recollecting properly, the Norwegian uh, ambassador was in Ankara, and he would come to Baku um, and for meetings, and and we would meet and, and talk. So the the pattern of you know having a you know no no formal diplomatic presence uh, is not unusual, and Norway has followed it before. I, I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry to see see that happen because the. Uh, Norwegians have been, uh, you know, out there in front on so many of the human rights and democracy issues, and it, they've been, uh, I know, for uh, American ambassadors, good, good fellows to to be associated with on on these issues. Uh, so we'll miss we'll miss that. But I, I doubt really if if Norway is going to going to change in any way. That's the the stance that it's been taking. Uh, you know, now for several decades in in uh, in Azerbaijan, but they'll have to be doing it remotely rather than than directly. 
Ambassador, uh, the uh, nomination of the U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan, new ambassador of, of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Lee Lisenberger, is believed mm. to be just a matter of days. Um, what can you tell us about the new um, ambassador to be if he's nominated, if he's approved, and also um, what, what does his portfolio speak of, the uh, political component? Uh, he served to NATO as right. U.S. Uh, headquarters to uh, NATO and also as a NATO deputy representative in Afghanistan. Do you think that will be relative to what he will be doing in Azerbaijan? Well, I don't know him personally. I know people who who have served with him, and as you point out, he's he's got a a tremendous background in terms of um, the the broader region. Uh, Afghanistan, I, I really consider part of the region. Uh, Azerbaijan sends uh, a small number, but nonetheless, a small uh, a number of troops to to be part of the international force there. Uh, the U.S. relies on, um, you know, connections to uh, Afghanistan um, via overflights as well as uh, uh, sea and land transportation uh, of supplies. So his background, uh, you know, I think is really quite uh, quite important. Uh, I don't um, you know, attach any any uh, particular. Uh, significance of the fact that he doesn't have an energy background, uh, you know, his two two predecessors immediately before uh, Master Morningstar and Master Chikuda, uh, well known uh, for for that background. But I, I I really do think that he probably you know comes at this time with the right kind of uh, credentials to be the U.S. ambassador in in Azerbaijan, and I. Uh, you know, I hope he he is given the chance, uh, not not from the U.S. side, but from the Azerbaijani side, to function effectively in in Azerbaijan, including having contacts with uh, with the opposition and with uh, uh, those people who represent uh, um, uh, media uh, outlets that uh, that aren't controlled by the government. Um, Mr. Ambassador, Section 907, the yeah. Freedom Support Act that bans any uh, direct U.S. funding to the Azerbaijani government, was put in effect very soon before you arrived as ambassador. And now John Bolton, when he was in the caucuses, discussed the possibility of suspending Section 907. Do you have it? What's your take on um, what the possibility is of this, if it has an effect, if it's um, if the Azerbaijanis are hoping that there'll be a suspension of this once again? Well, I, you know, I, I, you're, you're right to point out that I was, I was around when it came, came about. I was, in, in fact, I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, and uh, we were fighting very hard to keep that provision from being part of the first Freedom Support Act because we thought it was important at that that point as the uh, Soviet Union was, uh, you know, had broken up uh, to be able to provide basic assistance and technical assistance in particular to these newly emerging states. And uh, I, I know that Dick Miles, who was the first U.S. ambassador, and then I, when I succeeded him, always felt that we were at a disadvantage, that we could not do some of the things that ambassadors and other parts of the former Soviet Union could could do as far as you know bringing judges to the U.S. and seeing how how our legal system worked or uh, working directly with gov government officials on on some of the energy energy issues. Um, I, I've often thought, w would things be that different, uh, you know, on human rights grounds and democracy building had we not had Section 907. I, I can't answer that. I mean, I, I don't know that it's necessarily an exercise that leads you anywhere other than being frustrated to recall what, what went on before. But, uh, you know, I think anything that would take us toward, um, you know, lifting the, some of the restrictions uh, on 907. I know that was done right after the 9-11 uh, events and, and allowed uh, for the first time for us to have an aid mission uh, in Azerbaijan to do some things with the military, non-lethal kinds of training and, and uh, other related activities. Um, but the Azerbaijanis, uh, 
and for good reason, I think, will never be totally satisfied unless the provisions of 907 are lifted permanently, and that would take congressional action. And, you know, Mr. Bolton doesn't necessarily control that. Uh, so we, we may be kind of in an environment where the most useful thing would be to for the administration to look and see if there were other uh, steps that it could take within the framework of 907 to, to remove restrictions. Now, one thing I'm not in in favor of is providing lethal military equipment to, to the Azerbaijanis. Uh, as long as the conflict with Armenia over Nagorno-Karabakh remains where it is, um, I'm not sure that would be a helpful, helpful signal to be sending right now. Uh, fine, do more uh, you know, training of personnel or uh, helping those units that do go to Afghanistan to function effectively in that environment. But uh, I, I think to kind of open up Azerbaijan to major arms sales um, wouldn't be helpful, isn't necessary, and uh, sends the wrong signal right now. Um, Ambassador, so it's been now a year and a half that the uh, 907 hasn't been waived as before. What do you think has changed and what's your forecast for next year? Do you think President Trump will waive 907? You know, I really hadn't thought about it that much. My, my sense would be his instincts would be to waive it, um, and particularly after the Bolton visit. Uh, I, I have the feeling that the you know, the, the agenda item number one during that visit was Iran. And uh, I, I think that uh, to the extent that we um, want to have some form of cooperation with, uh, with Azerbaijan regarding Iran, it would, it would take some gesture on our part uh, to, to signal that we're, you know, we recognize that, that uh, Azerbaijan is in a difficult uh, geographic position and it, it, uh, it is not, uh, not in a position to be as, as cooperative as perhaps we would expect other countries to be regarding Iran. Um, as long as Nahichvan depends on trade uh, coming from, uh, from Azerbaijan through, uh, through Iran and also on energy coming from Iran, uh, it's we, we, we really shouldn't expect the, uh, the Azerbaijanis to do, to do a whole lot, uh, either with sanctions uh, or other steps. Uh, so it's a very delicate position that um, the administration has to walk with Azerbaijan when it comes, comes to Iran. And I hope, I hope we're, we're wise as we think about what we, we should or should not expect the Azerbaijanis to do. Uh, it's it's just uh, just a, a, a hard hard position to put Baku in. Uh, thank you. Moving on, uh, Joanne, shall we <laughs> go to our favorite part as the year <laughs> comes to an end? Mm -hmm. What do you? <laughs> how does the 2018 change the Southern Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia elections in all three countries? Right. And how did they, Russia's role change, if it did at all? Well, I, you know, it's, it's the Russian role, I think, is uh, the more interesting part of all of this. Um, it, it, it's uh, curious to me how much attention Russia has paid uh, to the Caucasus uh, right now. I mean, uh, there isn't a, a you know, a, a real, there, in other words, it wasn't really a, a problem that Russia needed to fix. Um, the ceasefire, despite the uh, four-day war in 2016, was is still still holding. Russian influence remains as it has been, um, you know, in, in important in in Azerbaijan. Um, there wasn't anything the United States was doing that would somehow result in confrontation with Russia. Uh, in fact, um, what I find I find most interesting and to a degree reassuring is that the Russian position on settling the conflict regarding Nagorno-Karabakh and the responsibility of both Yerevan and Baku to begin serious di diplomatic negotiations sounds almost identical to the U.S. position, both as articulated, and, and it hasn't been that much, but 
to the extent that that it's been articulated during the Trump administration and and U.S. administrations before it. Um, you know, we have so many problems in our relationship with Russia. And now Ukraine is just taking a, a nosedive in terms of uh, you know that part of the relationship. But but with uh, with Russia and Nagorno Karabakh, it actually the Minsk group works. Um, you know, we have a new. Uh, Minsk Group uh, uh, coordinator uh, from the U.S. side. Uh, he and his French and Russian colleagues uh, ju just recently were in in the region, um, and that that cooperation must must continue. Uh, so, uh, you know, Russia obviously wants to maintain its role and leverage. Uh, it has effectively used the sale of arms to both. Yerevan and to, to Baku to increase that leverage. Um, every time it sells or uh, gives, depending on the cir circumstances, additional weapons to one side or the other, the other side complains about it. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think that that kind of involvement is going to uh, going to continue. Uh, I what I'm what I'm concerned about the Russians not apparently being concerned about is what's going on in the North Caucasus. Uh, I think the uh, this this uh, very interesting little uh, agreement that was struck between Hadarov in uh, Chechnya and the Ingush over a border adjustment that, again, looking at the media, was done without a whole lot of uh, direction from from either Putin or or Moscow. You know, is a sign that. Uh, you know, there, there's potential trouble ahead for for the Russians in in the North Caucasus. Things are not um, are not very stable. Uh, so I I would expect in in the next year for Russia to pay pay more attention uh, more attention to that. But I think their basic interests remain, uh, and I'll just keep it focused on Armenia and Azerbaijan, is to prevent. Another outbreak of military conflict. Um, I don't think their interests are in a peaceful settlement uh, of the uh, dispute regarding Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, to use an an overworked phrase, uh, it's a frozen conflict, and that's to Russia's advantage. Um, so I'm I'm not expecting for uh, expecting many many surprises. Um, the one wild card in this is U.S.-Iranian relations, and uh, there could be uh, spillover if um, you know, something dramatic happens uh, as far as uh, um, you know the the U.S. Uh, uh, measures that that we're taking regarding Iran. Uh, but that's that's the one area where I think there you know there could be uh, more Russian activity in in 2019. Another topic that we've discussed um, a couple of times has to do with the conditions uh, regarding journalists in Azerbaijan and in much of the world. Um, the global issue of uh, Camille Kasoji. I think the president has not been helpful um, just in terms of U.S.-Saudi relations, which I'm not an expert in, but, um, you know, obviously we have we have strategic interests with in, in the, the Gulf region and with Saudi Arabia. But at some point, there are actions that just cross the line um, where you got to stand up and say, look, this was this was a crime and the people responsible for this need to be punished. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, if the media is to, to be believed here in the U.S. about uh, what Trump has been told by our, our intelligence community, then um, you know there's there can be no doubt uh, that um, that this was an ordered killing at the highest levels uh, in the Saudi government, and we should respond to that. Look, we we can you know we can sell arms, we can ask for Saudis' help on on oil, uh, and we can also say you know this this can't stand you've got to take demonstrable actions to bring to justice your own justice um the people who murdered this this journalist um this is just too big of a too big of an issue including azerbaijan people all over the world are watching including yeah. azerbaijan and you know as i 
the the degree of suppression of freedom of expression that continues in Azerbaijan is is really really remarkable and and events like the one that we've just talked about only encourage governments to to do more of that uh, take those kinds of steps if they see there's no consequence um, if the United States is not going to respond to the ordered killing of a journalist um, who just so happens to have been working for a U.S. newspaper and a resident of, of Northern Virginia, then what are we going to say about someone who isn't an American resident or isn't associated with U.S. media who is thrown in jail or forced to, to leave the country or more tragically, whose family is is punished in in the name of that that person. Um, so I, I just I'm I'm very very concerned about uh, uh, about this uh, development and what the implications are more widely and and particularly in Azerbaijan. Um, there aren't that many. I, I'm sorry to say, aren't that many journalists in Azerbaijan now who haven't already been up in uh, the uh, suppression, but um, there's always the families and uh, no sign that uh, that the present government is gonna change its continued oppression, uh, suppression of freedom of expression. And speaking of which, another journalist uh, was uh, detained, arrested for okay. uh, 30 days just yes. today. Um, Joanne? Well, um, we noticed that you are um, the director of the Center for Energy, Science and Policy at George Mason University as well. And we were wondering about the situation with um, oil sales in Azerbaijan and much of the rest of the world. Um, how are these oil sales and this conflicting and moving price of oil ha having an effect on um, policies around the world? Well, it you know, I've often thought about how much has changed in the, the 20, 20 years since I was ambassador in, in Baku when it comes to energy, because we were, uh, at, the, at the time uh, that I arrived, we, we signed the contract of the century with, with Haider Aliyev, and that opened up Azerbaijani uh, offshore oil resources to foreign investment. And it was a great accomplishment both for Azerbaijan and for the U.S. and, and uh, the West, Western companies uh, who were involved there. Um, and that was done at a time when we didn't know where, essentially, where the next barrel of oil was going to come from. Uh, there wasn't any new discoveries taking place uh, anywhere in the world. And so when, when significant amounts of oil were, were discovered offshore in Azerbaijan, this is a really important step for U.S. strategic interests because it lessened dependence on, on Middle Eastern uh, oil in particular. Well, fast forward to 2018 and the biggest oil export producer in the world is the United States. The biggest gas producer in the world may be the United States if, if you know, Russia kind of nudges us out. We've, we've totally shifted the table when it comes to the to the energy issue and what that means is that Azerbaijan as an energy producer um, not that it's unimportant but it is not as important in a strategic sense as it was in the 90s and I'm not sure that message clearly is understood in Baku um, but uh, you know times changed needs changed and you know we are we are now uh, under the Trump administration pursuing a policy of energy dominance. And my goodness, I don't know what that means, um, but uh, you know, there's gonna be a lot more activity regarding US energy exports to Europe, to Asia, uh, than we could have dreamed of just a few years ago. Ambassador, follow up, uh, given that the um, oil prices are fluctuating again, are falling, and uh, and many believe that the uh, new Titan DOA sanctions against Iran have contributed to that. How do you think it's going to change the uh, situation? Can it lead 
to a new uh, crisis in uh, in, in southern Caucasus, uh, including Azerbaijan, w with a new devaluation of the currency? Yeah, I, I think that's really a, a, a great risk because one of the, I mean, there are a lot of things I wish had gone better uh, over the last two decades uh, for Azerbaijan, human rights being, being one of those. But the one, the other one is the lack of any economic reform and diversification. Uh, Azerbaijan needs to move off its dependence on oil revenues for for its budget and for its economic growth. Uh, and there's a lot of rhetoric out there, including from from the president, about you know how how the uh, the Azerbaijani economy is diversifying into to different areas. But uh, if you just look at the numbers, um, it still is all about oil and gas. And you know that's okay, but but you need to plan for a future where oil and gas may may not necessarily be the uh, the commodities that they are today. And uh, given the the trends, you know, that I mentioned of, of other oil and gas producers, plus uh, changes in energy demand in in Europe for renewables as opposed to carbon based based fuels, uh, Azerbaijan needs to position itself in in quite a different way. And to do that is going to um, you know, break a lot of crockery among the uh, the elites who depend on oil and gas revenues coming in as they always always have. If you can have serious reform, you got to reform the banking system, which is still in the middle of a major crisis, um, and you have to diversify into new products uh, that um, you know on. On, on paper, the Azerbaijani uh, government is saying the right thing about IT and agriculture and all, but I just don't see the signs of that actually taking taking place. Um, so that that's a that that I think is a real a real concern. And if energy price, uh, you know, I just looked. Uh, I always go to my my phone at least once a day because I teach a class in geopolitics of energy to see what the oil price is. Well, I see it's dropped again. And uh, uh, you know Trump is going to going to keep uh, keep beating the drums uh, on on lowering um, lowering oil prices even more, uh, and that's not going to be a good thing for for countries like Azerbaijan, which depends so much on the price of oil being you know in the uh, you know seventy eighty dollar a barrel range, and doesn't appear that's going to happen uh, again anytime soon. But who knows? Oil prices are all over the place. Uh, as with the stock market as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we probably want to leave you, unless, uh, Savinji, you have another question, but I, we, we talk a lot about the conflicts that are happening in the Caucasus and some of the negative things that are happening, but as the director of peace, or interim director of peace operations policy at George Mason, um, where might peace be breaking out in the Caucasus? Do we have any positive notes on this um, at, toward the end of in 2018? Well, peace, you know, I actually think peace could break out between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I, mean, I, I don't follow Armenia as closely, obviously, as, as I do Azerbaijan, but I think the political changes there are significant um, because it um, it's not just, you know, transferring power between members of the same clan or in, in, in the case of Armenia, you know, the Karabatskis. Um, it, this, is a, this is an opportunity, I think, if, if the Armenians are prepared to, to seize it, to, to really settle peacefully the conflict regarding Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, it's going to depend on leaders in both countries being prepared to talk to their people about compromise, um, you know that's diplomacy 101. In order to get an agreement, you compromise, and that means that not your wildest dreams about uh, whatever whatever position your your particular country is taking are going to be achieved. And it's not a sign of failure to to compromise. Uh, but this is conflict has gone on so long and in kind of a zero-sum atmosphere where anybody who talks about negotiating, um, certainly on the Azerbaijani side, um, is regarded as, as not being uh, you know strong enough supporter of, of Azerbaijan. Um, 
that has to change, has to change in Armenia. The Armenians have to be prepared to give up the occupied territories around Nagorno-Karabakh. The Madrid pr principles, uh, perfect uh, basis for negotiations. There's no, there's no better solution than, than outlined there. Uh, but it's going to take leaders who are prepared to say to the people, we have to settle this. It's in our interest to establish a normal relationship between our, our neighbors uh, and to put this this horrible conflict uh, in in the history books and build a better future. And that, you know, that's that's doable. It's you know, we're not asking, um, you know, for the sky here, but uh, it it. It could be done, and um, you know, it, it's just going to take good, good leadership in both capitals to to make it happen. Ambassador, thank you very much. You. Thanks for joining us, Ambassador. It's been a real honor. Well, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, happy, if I don't talk to you before, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to happy you New too. Year indeed. <laughs>